live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Even though the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Kansas City Chiefs are in opposing conferences, and have been every single season except for 1976, there have been quite a few memorable moments in the history of the series. You have the iconic season finale in 1979, when the Buccaneers won 3 0 to clinch their first division title in franchise history in some of the worst weather conditions imaginable. You have their crazy overtime thriller in 2008, when the Buccaneers, down 24 3, came all the way back, scored the game tying touchdown with 19 seconds left, and then won it on a game winning field goal. You had their meeting in 2020, when Tyreek Hill went for 203 yards in the first quarter alone. And then you have Super Bowl 55, where the Buccaneers became the first team ever to win the Super Bowl in their home city. But despite all the memorable games of the history of the series, you might not know about this one. And considering the circumstances going into the game, it might be the weirdest game in the over 45 year history of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers franchise. Because in 1986, prior to a game against the Chiefs, the Buccaneers did not have enough players on their roster. Seriously. Through a series of questionable roster decisions, poor roster management, and unfortunate luck and timing, the Bucs went into their game against Kansas City about as thin as humanly possible. And this is the story behind one of the strangest games in Buccaneers history. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand how we got to this point, mainly with understanding how an NFL team can somehow not have enough players to fill a roster. And while this might not seem as weird nowadays, mainly because we've seen some crazy roster situations because of the pandemic, back in 1986 when this wasn't an issue, it was incredibly bizarre. In 1986, there were very few, if any, expectations for the Buccaneers. The team was an abysmal 2-14 in Lehman Bennett's first season as head coach. They had some of the worst odds of any team to win the Super Bowl. Their number one overall pick refused to play for them, because the Buccaneers royally screwed over Bo Jackson. I talked about that debacle in a previous video of mine, so if you want to learn more about that, then click the card in the upper right corner. And just as everyone expected, the Buccaneers opened up the season looking atrocious. Through the first six weeks, they were 1-5, with a lone win coming against the Detroit Lions. They had back-to-back -back overtime losses in that stretch, coming against the Atlanta Falcons and Los Angeles Rams. They had an abysmal game against the San Francisco 49ers, where in a 31-7 loss, starting quarterback Steve DeBerg threw seven interceptions. That's right, seven interceptions. His pass rating in that game was 30.6 which, while worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball to the ground on every single play, is still way better than I thought it would be since, you know, he threw seven interceptions. But as bad as all that was, and trust me, it was bad, the lowest point was yet to come. Because in Week 7, the Buccaneers laid an egg. When against the Saints team that was 2-4 at the time, they lost 38-7. Tampa Bay turned it over five times, got outgained 450-220 in total yardage, and held the ball for just 24 minutes while averaging less than 3 yards per carry, and allowing the Saints to run for 265 yards on over 5 yards per carry. The game was a train wreck, and Bennett was half angry, half distraught afterwards, saying I didn't see any bright spots at all. It was by far the worst game we played. I'm down on myself, down on the team, down on the coaching staff, the whole thing. He knew that he needed to make a drastic change to shake things up. Little did he know that this change would lead to some of the strangest roster drama you're ever going to see. By this point, the Buccaneers were 1-6. Their season was over, and Bennett's seat was pretty hot. He was only the second coach in the history of the franchise, and considering the fact that his record was 3-20, winning just 13% of his games since taking over in 1985, he knew that he needed to do something big. This current team just wasn't cutting it, and understandably so. Their 1-6 record was tied for the worst in the NFC. Their 107 points scored, or just over 15 points per game, ranked 4th worst in the NFC. Their 191 points allowed, or just over 27 points per game, ranked high with the Green Bay Packers for the worst total in the NFC. They were abysmal, and Bennett knew that if this team was going to have a fighting chance over the second half of the season, and if he was going to keep his job, that he needed to make some drastic changes. I think it's safe to say that the day after their loss to the Saints, that's exactly what Bennett decided to do. Because that Monday, he cut three players, all three of whom were starters. Jimmy Giles was a four-time Pro Bowl tight end who was one of the greatest players in franchise history, and might have been the best offensive player the Bucks ever had at the time. Heck, he made it to the Pro Bowl in 1985 with a career-high eight touchdown catches, was the all-time leader in franchise history in touchdown catches, and was one of the best tight ends in the conference during the first half of the 1980s. He was now gone. Kevin House started every game at wide receiver for Tampa Bay, and had gone over 1,000 yards in two of the previous five seasons. He was also the all-time leader in franchise history in receptions and receiving yards. He was now gone. And Ron Spring's best days were behind him in Dallas, but he was still in the starting lineup most of the time. He was now gone. 
cutting Giles' house in Springs and cutting three veterans, two of whom were somewhat a franchise legends at the time, was a highly controversial move that put a lot of people, especially the older veterans, on alert. And Bennett admitted as much, saying that even though the three men hadn't played up to his standards, that this was still a drastic move. Bennett also said that he cut them because the Bucks weren't going to the Super Bowl anytime soon, and he wanted to develop the younger guys. This felt like Bennett was hitting the panic button. Bennett flat out said, I really don't know how the team will react. The players we released were surprised, and they didn't understand my way of thinking. When you do something this drastic, you need to have a plan. And the Bucks' plan was, well, let's just say it was Murphy's Law in action. Because everything that could go wrong in the build-up to the Chiefs game absolutely did. When you cut three players, naturally, you need to go out and sign three players to fill the void. That's exactly what Lehman Bennett did. His first order of business was signing running back Rick Paros. He hadn't done much of anything in a while, and the last time he played was in 1985 with the Seattle Seahawks, when he had just 19 rushing yards all season. But he used to be a pretty solid player. The former fourth-round pick from the 1980 NFL Draft had a solid year in 1981, when as the starting fullback of the Denver Broncos, he had nearly 1,000 yards from scrimmage and averaged over 4 yards per carry, even scoring quite a few game-winning touchdowns in his time at Mile High, like this one in the fourth quarter against the Detroit Lions. The second player he signed was running back Joe Carter. He had just been cut by the Miami Dolphins and wasn't doing a whole lot for them that season, only having four carries. However, the former fourth-round pick showed some flashes just two years before as a rookie in 1984, when he had 100 rushing attempts and averaged five yards per carry. Not only did Carter rank fifth in the NFL that season amongst all qualified runners, but he actually led the entire AFC in this category. The leader in yards per carry amongst AFC runners was none other than Joe Carter, who at one point had a three-game stretch where he had 39 carries and averaged over 7.4 yards per attempt. He was going to stay in the Sunshine State after this move. And the third player he signed was tight end Chris Faulkner. Yes, it seems a bit weird that Bennett did not sign a wide receiver, even though he cut Kevin House, but that's beside the point. The former fourth-round pick did next to nothing in the NFL. He had just two catches his entire career. But this was what Bennett had in mind to replace the three high-priced veterans, Rick Paros, Joe Carter, and Chris Faulkner. These were the three mid-season signings. Obviously, this is a downgrade on paper. The odds that you're finding anyone off the street better than these three men you just cut are slim. But this was Bennett's desperation move. Guess how many of the three men actually played? You guessed it, none of them. Let's start with Rick Paros. After the Bucks acquired him that Tuesday, all he had to do was show up on Wednesday, sign the contract, and he would be playing with the team and probably would be getting a good chunk of reps considering how thin the Bucks were at that position. He never showed up. All that we know is that there were personal problems that prevented him from signing with the team, although we have no clue what exactly those problems were. Alright, so that didn't work out. Maybe Joe Carter will work out. Well, when he got to Tampa and did his physical, the doctors discovered that there was fluid in his knee that would make him unlikely to play. Carter flunked the physical, and was not signed. Two players down, and none of them wound up signing. The good news was that Chris Faulkner signed. At least they got one, right? Well, not quite. Because at practice that Thursday, he tore ligaments in his left knee and had to get surgery. All three players that the Buccaneers tried to sign to replace the three men they cut either wound up not signing or signed and got hurt. And this meant that going into their game against the Chiefs, the Buccaneers literally did not have enough men to fill a roster. Everyone on the Bucs knew how unlucky and terrible this situation was. Guard Sean Farrell was unamused by the whole thing, saying it must be bad karma presumably referring to Bennett's decision to let some of the longtime team leaders go. Quarterback Steve Young, who would eventually learn what it was like to be on a functional franchise, said that this whole week had been a shock and felt like an airplane crash. And even Lehman Bennett seemed out of answers at this point, saying on the whole thing, quite a week, we'll see what happens. Just to recap where we are, the Buccaneers cut three players, and none of the three players that they acquired were able to go, so now they had just 44 players on the active roster instead of the 45-man limit that every other team has. And when the Buccaneers played the Chiefs that Sunday, it went about as well as you'd expect. October 26, 1986. The 4-3 Kansas City Chiefs are right in the thick of things for a playoff spot, as they're tied with the 4-3 Patriots, 4-3 Raiders, and 4-3 Browns for the final spot. If they want to make it to the postseason, or possibly even have a shot at winning the division, then a win here would go a long way. And their opponent is a Buccaneers team that had won just one of its last 22 road games, had gone 3-20 under their current head coach, and doesn't even have enough players to fill a roster because of how poorly Lehman Bennett handled the entire situation, and because of some of the worst injury luck you're ever going to see. How do you think this game is going to go? If you said that the Chiefs win, then congratulations on using common sense. Because you're right. 
While it was closer than I think a lot of people expected, as the Buccaneers led at the half and the game was tied at one point in the fourth quarter, the Chiefs wound up winning at 27-20. The stat sheet shows a game dominated by the Chiefs, especially when it came to throwing the football. Kansas City had 355 yards of total offense compared to 216 for the Buccaneers, and outgained the Bucs 222-86 in net passing yards, as Steve Young got sacked five times. The loss dropped the Buccaneers to 1-7, and the Buccaneers would finish the season with another abysmal 2-14 record. To the surprise of no one, Lehman Bennett would not return as the head coach in 1987. There's mishandling a roster situation, and then there's this. Granted, it's tough to entirely blame Bennett for this, as I don't think anyone could foresee trying to sign three players, and all three players not being able to go, with one not playing for personal reasons, one flunking a physical, and one suffering a fluke injury in practice. But this game and this whole situation showcased an important lesson in the NFL. Winning a game is already hard enough. The last thing you want to do is be shorthanded and not be able to fill out a roster. Because when you do, well, a lot of times, your game and your season is going to go a lot like that. And if you don't believe me, just ask the 1986 Buccaneers how that worked out for them. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.